uh, Reverend Charlie Garrett up. Uh, it's my privilege just to introduce him. About two and a half years ago, Charlie um, came to Grace and wanted to be ordained. And so he attended for about a year and uh, was very active during this time. He teaches a Sunday school class and uh, it's just been a vital, vital part of the ministry. And um, uh, about a year later, uh, we, as a church, ordained him, recognized God's calling on his life. And Charlie's just had a really amazing ministry. You may know him from some of his ministries. He has a ministry out at the beach on Sunday nights where they uh, meet together and worship God. Uh, he also has a very active Facebook ministry, too, and uh, uh, ministers and touches a lot of people through that. And uh, last year, he traveled across the whole country, going to every capital in the U.S., uh, learning about uh, the Christian heritage of this country and, uh, and doing a lot of street evangelism and preaching. And so would you just uh, join me in welcoming uh, Reverend Charlie Garrett? <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me, we have to do a test. Unfortunately, with the beard, the microphone has to be lower than normal. Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, I was asked by Seth to preach here, and as he said, I have something that I do on Sunday afternoons, and it takes a lot of effort during the week, especially mental effort, and if you know the size of my brain, there's not a lot of spare room. So I actually thought, I don't know if I can do this or not. And the first thing that popped into my head was Linda Dwyer's angry red face. And the reason why I say that is because she has missed all of my sermons, and she's always reminding me about that. She's saying, oh, I'm getting to see your sermon. Well, you know, if her husband would stay out of the hospital or if she'd stop traveling to Zaire or wherever, we wouldn't have this problem. But anyway, you can either thank or blame Linda for this today. And then something else happened. Seth, when he emailed me, he was talking about two separate things. And as I was reading, I read them as one thing. And so I thought that he wanted me to preach on 1 Corinthians chapter 5 today. And I prepared for that, and I prepared for that. And on Tuesday, I posted it on Facebook. This is what I'm going to be talking about. And I get an email from somebody in Texas, Will Groban, who attends here sometimes. And uh, he said, Charlie, that series isn't until August. And I went back and I read their email again. And I called Seth and I said, what do I, you know, which is it? He said, no, you misunderstood me, and uh, you can speak on anything within reason. That's what his email said. <laughs> and so today, we are going to speak on why Christian men should wear beards. <laughs> Actually, I emailed my daughter about that. I had started typing that. And I said, what do you think? Is that within reason in Tangerine over at Anna's? She said, no, 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 don't do that. So today we're going to speak on Christology, the person and work of Jesus Christ. And I suppose that that qualifies with, within reason. So Jesus had a beard though, didn't he? Just saying. Before I get into Christology though, I want you to think on, and some of my people in the, my Sunday school class know who he is, but who is the shortest person in the Bible? And you know the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man that climbed up in the sycamore fig tree, and he uh, wanted to see Jesus. But he certainly isn't the shortest person in the Bible, because shorter than him was Lo Am I from the book of Hosea. But even shorter than him is a man named Nehemiah by the book by his name. But even shorter than him is a man named Bildad the Shuhite. And that's a very small person. But believe it or not, there's somebody that's not even as tall as Bildad. Actually, there's two people. Their names are Peter and James. Because while Jesus slept, well, I'm sorry, while Jesus prayed in the garden, they slept on their watch. So they're very small people. Anyway, it, it's a cute joke, but the fact is that they slept while Jesus agonized over the trial to come. So of all the doctrines in the Bible, the one about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, our Lord, known as Christology, is the one that I cherish the most. I love the doctrine of the Trinity, the nature of God, and thinking about that. I love to grapple with the doctrine of sin, which is the doctrine of hamartiology. And then my class, I think, prefers the doctrine of eschatology, or the study of last things. We've been doing that for, it seems like, three years now. 
and I avoid the doctrine of ecclesiology like the plague, which is the study of the church. That is not my thing. But I simply cannot get enough of Jesus Christ. Florence Nightingale said, people talk about imitating Christ and imitate him in the trifling little things, the formal things, such as washing their feet, saying his prayer, and so on. But if anyone attempts the real imitation of him, there are no bounds to the outcry with which the presumption of that person is condemned. Jesus is the standard of our faith. He is the one to model. He is the one who reveals the very heart of God to us. And as Miss Nightingale noticed, when we try to put him in the proper position in our lives, people just can't handle it. Jesus is just okay when we use him as a doorstop, but when we put him as the capstone of our life at the top of the doorway, people cringe. And if you want proof of that, all you need to do is hop into my Jesus truck with me someday and drive down the road and see the hand gestures and the angry faces as people pass by. But you'll also see the people that give you the thumbs up and they beep and they make a big deal of it. So it kind of balances each other out. But people do not like Jesus if they don't believe in Jesus. They hate him, in fact. Were we to speak fully on the doctrine of Christ today, Christology, the sermon would never end. And in fact, with the little bit that I know about Jesus, we could talk till Wednesday without taking a break. And if we add in the quotes about him from people of ages past, we'd be old and gray and we would just be getting started. So my pitiful attempt today at explaining Christology to you needs by necessity to be cut short so that we can all go home and take a nap. But he is there, even at that time, mediating for us between us and his Father. Because even in our sinful dreams, we reveal who we really are. And we need a mediator even then. So here's our text verse for today. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who is the Christ, and what is the significance of being Christ? does that really mean to the people of the world? May God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. Point number one today is the promised one. A man named Anthony Coniara said, it is as if God the Father is saying to us, since I've told you everything in my word, who is my son, I have no other words that can at present say anything or reveal anything to you beyond this. Fix your eyes on him alone, a reference to Hebrews 12, too. For in him I have told you all, revealed all, and in him you will find more than you desire or ask. If you fix your eyes on him, you will find everything, for he is my whole word and my reply. He is my whole vision and my revelation. In Genesis, the third chapter and the 15th verse, we read these words, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This verse is known as the Proto-Evangelium, or the first gospel, because it's the first specific mention of one who would come to undo what we had so catastrophically fouled up when we believed the lies of the devil. However, I assure you that this is not, although it's the first specific mention of Christ, it is not the first hint of Christ in the Bible. There are subtle hints of him that go right back to Genesis 1.1. If you look closely enough, you will find Jesus Christ in every word of the Bible. He's revealed there somehow because God is telling us of one who was and one who is and one who is to come. When I was just coming to know the Lord about 10 years ago, a pastor said something to me that I've always remembered. When you read the Bible, ask yourself, how does this point to Jesus? Now, I don't know if that was his thoughts or not. I have no idea. But it opened up the Bible in a way to me that is simply astonishing. And I would hope that you would follow that advice, advice as you go throughout your Bible reading. You see, it is all about him in the end. We just need to determine how this is so. Here are a couple tidbits I want to give you from an account in Genesis. Now, if you've read the account of Genesis, which I hope you have, then you've read the account of Jacob, who is Israel. 
in a, the account of how Jacob married a girl named Rachel. And Rachel had a couple of children, and when she had her second child, he died, or she died, as she was giving birth to him. Well, let's read the account together, and then we'll talk about it. Then they journeyed from Bethel, and when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Ben-Oni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. Now this one paragraph gives you a lot more information about Christ than you may imagine. You say, why is this in here? Is it just so that we feel bad about a guy losing his wife, a child born without a mother, or is there something more? We'll start out with what the meaning of Bethel is. Now, you see this chart behind you. It's a little jumbled. I'm not good at PowerPoints, but I've tried to give you some of the information I'm going to talk about here. Bethel, Bethel, means house of God, and that's a picture of heaven. And as Jesus said, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. And they were on their way from Bethel down to Bethlehem. Well, we all know that's where Jesus was born. Bethlehem is known as Bethlehem, the house of bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. So this is a picture of the Redeemer coming down from heaven and going to Bethlehem and being fulfilling the bread of life, which is the name of that. But as well, it says that it's named Ephrath. And you think, well, why is it in there? We know it's Bethlehem. But Bethlehem, Ephrath means fruit or fruitful. And it's another picture of the Christ, which says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And then we have the name of the mother who died, Rachel, or Rachel, which is a ewe lamb. What is the child of a lamb? It's a male lamb. It says here in the uh, book of John, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then it says in the book of Isaiah, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And in the Greek translation of this passage from Isaiah, the word amnos is used, which is a sacrificial lamb. It's not just any lamb, it's a lamb that was taken to the temple and it was sacrificed there for the sins of the people. And John, when he quoted that in the New Testament, he says, behold, the amnos of God, the sacrificial lamb. So even there, we, they're parallel in this one paragraph speaking of them. And then it says here, Rachel labored in childbirth and she had hard labor. And that's a picture of us in our own lives before we come to Christ in the whole creation itself laboring, as it says in the book of Romans, because the creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. And then the maidservant said to Rachel, do not fear. And in the same way, the Lord's angel said to the Lord's maidservant, Mary, do not be afraid, do not fear, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and she'll call his name Jesus. And as she was dying, she said, he is Benoni, which means the son of my suffering. And we read in the New Testament, New Testament about Jesus' suffering when he said, though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And we read about the suffering on and on as he fulfilled this picture of this one paragraph. And then it says, so Rachel died. And it says in the book of Romans again, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. And she's dying in the way the body of flesh, waiting for her coming redeemer, who her son pictured. And then what happened? The father says, it's not Benoni. Benjamin, ben Yamin, the son of my right hand. And as we read in the book of Mark, it says, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And throughout the New Testament, we see the son of the right hand mentioned again and again. 